It's the Wrestling Perspective. That guy's Lars. I'm Dennis. We just did a whole thing about Boston. We're going to skip past it. Gentlemen, we have Lord William Stephen Regal, podcast host extraordinaire from one of my favorite podcasts. Matt Kuhn is one of my favorite people on earth. And to have William Regal here with us, who, by the way, you may not know this, is a wrestler, or used to be at least. <laughs> I only know him from podcasts, but now well, you know I get what? to know him. I got to say something. I got to say something because Ooh. I mean, he, I mean, how old are you? How old are you, Regal? It's, it's Darren. Oh, oh William, don't call me like, like, like a dog. That, that's, I, that's I apologize. Stuff. I apologize. You've never called, and then all worked. the times you've met me, have you ever called me Regal? It's a, people in America need to know that. In, if you ever talk to English people, calling them by the last name is very, it's it's like a really put put down that like I don't understand. I understand. I understand. It's your legit Darren last Steve, name, Darren, Steve, William, whatever you All want right. to call me. I don't care. Can I just call you? I don't care, I, but don't call me by my last name. Can I just Grindel, call you? Like, can I? Can I just call you Dick? You can call me whatever <laughs> you want. I don't care, right. except for my last name. My All granddad. Right. My granddad used to go. Honestly, used to drill it into me, and I used to go to school and get caned and i mean when it went you know i didn't stop corporal punishment until i was 40 or 13 and he said don't let because it was like a class system in britain don't let anybody ever call you by your last name so when they used to say matthews to me which is my real name i used to just sit there because he was a big influence on me and well, I so you're, get you're getting rid of, you're getting right. you're getting mad at me. No, but calling, it's just calling. No, hold on, hold on. let's just let's just let's just let's, let's put play some facts here. I called you your work name, still your last yeah. name, and you're getting you're, you're 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 you got heat with me now for calling you Regal. I okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Matthews. No, 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 no. Just just. I'm just Darren gonna call, Williams. Okay. Podcast is off to a great it, start. It, hey, yeah. cunt! How old are you? That that's that's there we go. I'm 54, and let me just start off by saying, <laughs> well, not saying I'm going to sing to you because I, I I haven't seen you for, for at least a month. Yeah. He came into my life, and now he's taking over. He's so beautiful. He's simply beautiful. Because there you are. Look at you in all your glory. You know, look I love you. you, pal. I I'm, love not, you. I'm nice I love... that you. I'm glad that you've dressed up for the occasion. Anyway, you're well, scruffy. Dennis, guess. Dennis, I've got me. I've got me camera. nice woolen Fred Perry on here. I thought I you'd have that. Least had a Fred Perry on. I've got I, a I, nice I, woolen Fred Perry on. You know what? Hand I'll knitted. tell you what. There we go. You want? You want? You want? I go. mean, you want to look good? We can. Yeah, look there good. we go. We can talk about looking good all day long. Because I Tattoo, look good. Buddy. Look at you. Yes. Look at you. I got. I. The one you don't get. I've often wondered this because. We we know each other, just ladies and gentlemen. We know each other for what about fifteen years now? I think he's mad, isn't it? Long time, yeah. Fifteen years, but you know, I know what you are, and but people in England would know what you are. People in America, when you look like you look, it's a wonder you don't get stoned. Stone going get down the street, right? (laughs) You you must have a lot of explaining to do to people. Well, you know, I, I. like I, I got into like trying to explain the other week between the thing about original skinheads, which right. were multiracial, scar loving, reggae loving skinheads, and yeah. then what became the, the the skinhead thing, which was people in the the, the late seventies that hijacked the look because it was a, right. a tough look. But you you are you know you look the way you are, but you are. Same as I'm, me. We, we, all, we, yes. we, we just love everybody and we, we're all into our thing. I, I don't it, it, I don't care. Well, you don't care. Oh, good for you. Like I I mean I I, I don't like but well, at no, least I mean, for me, for me, that whole culture comes from Jamaica, Jamaican yes, reggae. Of course it is. And if you if you're ignorant so, of the fact, but mo- I mean, most Americans are completely ignorant that, of the fact that's true. The original that's true. skinheads were were just right. We're we're on a this is interesting to me. By the way, this is so, my perfect first question for me. Okay, can, because, can I just finish this little yeah, thing? Yeah. So there was no people of, of any other race really in Britain until after World War II, um, because we've been through two world wars, right? And then after World War II, all the young men had been and been killed, and so you know, I'm I'm very proud to be English, but 
the British government have done some horrendous things to the world and took over the you know different parts of the world. So they invited a lot of people into Britain after in, in 1950, and it's called the Windrush ge uh, generation of people from the Caribbean that came over. Well, they brought their culture over and they became part of Britain. And so the, their, the first bunch of children that were born were with, with my age group uh, and a little bit before me, if you like 60 or whatever. So we all grew up together and we just realized we're all the same. And then, and there's not, I never got it when I came to this country, when you've had 400 years to figure it out and you're still not getting on. I don't, I don't get it, right? You, you can understand people in Britain who are 80 or 90 who've been through world wars and don't know, have been told to be frightened of anybody that's from a different country. But I, I'm so, that's where me and Lars sort of connect on a, on a different level. We, we both, grew, we, we're, we're different from youth cultures that understand music brought us all together you know like with me it was the, the specials and I was always a soul music fan and I still am, and that's my biggest thing is but it, it's a a thing that is 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 whatever and, and Lars is is an original well he's in at least and one of the 10,000 bands that he's in because he doesn't give any other guitar players any work one of the, the 10,000 10, yeah 10,000 bands that he's in is, is an original skinny band, but they are they were formed from mixed race um, Afro-Caribbean um, children in England, well, not t teenagers in England, with um, English lads, and it, they were all, I mean, the truth is they were all about going out and causing trouble, but th they all like reggae, and they all like um, um scar and and so that that's where our connection comes in that's why we both wear and they'll wear fred perry shirts and stuff it's all a but unfortunately the the the, the look got hijacked by right-wing idiots who, who so we've we, we've just given we've just enlightened some of people the people who will listen to this because most people will never hear this except for when me and you talk and it, it should be heard it should be That's a, true. because That's it, true. It, it is a, a a big thing of a connection of ours is different genres of music and scarby and reggae and whatever being one of them and um the, there is a difference between what he looks like and me so right there we go that's an interesting start isn't it yeah it is interesting it is. but i know dennis well you know when you came over uh, in 1990, it seemed like you were portraying Me, kind of, uh, 1993. 1993. Over, yes. You were portraying the American version of what uh, us Americans would yes. think what the British were. And I always wondered if if that hooligan culture caught on over here, do you think you could have maybe portrayed that kind of character opposed to the lordship kind of stuff you went towards in wrestling? Uh, absolutely. I'd have gone with whatever connected with my audience. Um, and it was a decision when I came over here, I was just playing old Steve Regal. And I was brought over to do by Bill Watts, who, who was in charge of WCW, to do a, and he wanted a certain style of wrestling from me. Mm. And which was, which is what I did, which was a European, what they call international heavyweight style. There was a few European um, wrestlers that went all over the world and influenced many parts of the world. And it's the uh, uh, sticking certain diff cravats and different styles of and uppercuts and different things. You had to have a certain skill set and you had to look believable and credible. And I came over here on that. That was what got me got me to America because he, he it, I'd done, I'd worked for WCW in, in England in 1991. I'd worked for WWE in England in, in 1991. They gave me a tryout. They said, when we've got the right character for you, we'll bring you over. WCW said, when we've got the right character, uh, sorry, when we've got a, play, a, a place, we'll bring you over. WCW offered me the deal first. I knew that, unfortunately, European wrestling was on the way. Well, definitely British wrestling. And I, I, from 20 to 24, 
I was never in England, maybe two to three months of the year. I was traveling the world because I was an international heavyweight. I, I started off as a teenager, but then I became an international heavyweight. And there was really only four of us. There was myself, um, and I was the apprentice kind of thing. I was the, the younger version, but there was Dave Taylor, Terry Rudge, and Pete Roberts. And um, we were the fellas that were going all over to, to Germany. To I wasn't going to Japan at that time, but they were Japan, uh, everywhere that there was wrestling because we were credible heavyweights that wore the high trunks and the boots and did the solid wrestling style. In America, you it started off with, well, long before my time, but the most famous would be Billy Robinson and then Tony Charles, who was from Wales, and Les Thornton was in, in different, all over different territories in America. And then in uh, WWE in the, in the mid eighties, then obviously Dynamite Kid, which was a, a, a popularized, uh, helped popularize the junior heavyweight style and then got you know had, but when they came to america they didn't sort of do that style the only person doing the the original british style was les thornton in the 80s uh, chris adams as well like he didn't do the his traditional british style so i came over to do that and and bill watts wanted me to do that well as a just a normal sort of even uh, I mean, I looked like I was, because I was a, a, a baby-faced wrestler. That, that was mostly what I did in Europe. In fact, everywhere in Europe, I was always a baby face until I went at the occasional, like India or, or somewhere in Africa or wherever I went. Then I would be a more of a wrestling villain. Um, and so I thought I need to connect with this audience because I don't know how long I'm going to last. Bill Watts didn't last, he only lasted three months of my initial <laughs> start in America. And then he'd gone, well, I, I've, I've been enough places in, in that 10 years previous to know that when the person who brings you in leaves, so do you. Mm. So I needed, so I thought, what's everybody, not everybody, but I knew there'd been enough people that had been to America uh, that were the British that had been Lord something. Even Billy Robinson for a time had been mm. Sir Billy Robinson and Lord Alfred Hayes had popularised. So I, I basically made Dusty Rhodes think that that was his idea. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. So, and that was how I got to be, become Lord Stephen. If it would, if, if, if it had been in the beginning of the 2000s and Lockstock and two smoking barrels would have come out, I would have tried to have done anything that would have you would have you would have been you would you would have been the Millwall brawl. Whatever it whatever it may be, I would have adapted to that. The Lord thing just got me a foot in the door. Hang on, the phone's going. There's nobody ever calls my house phone. If it's invisible man, tell him I can't see it. <laughs> Please. Right. Right. So it all right. Let's get rid of that. It never rings. It's some deck collectors again. There we go. We're getting the house took off us. My mother in law's coming. Actually, it might be her. She's coming. And I know because the mice are throwing themselves on the traps. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> All the old ones are the best. Lars knows. They, they are. They are. So, they're, so, classic. They're, co yeah. they're called classic for a reason. Right, right. So that was. 93 was, I, I, there's a series of films in, in, I'm a big British comedy fan. There's a series of films that are really famous in Britain called Carry On Movies. And there was a Carry On Everything. Carry On Sergeant, Carry On uh, Doctor, Carry On This, Carry On. <coughs> and they were always- the third, And it's funny because the third Oi record because of those movies was called Carry On Oi. Right. So it, it was like me, all these comedy influences that I had, as well as the wrestling, putting it all together, Lord Stephen Regal, bosh. And that's how you got all the nonsense. And still to this day, he's all, uh, William Regal now has just evolved into 
I don't know where most of it comes from, but it's I'm a variety act. I'm a, as we call in England, you called it vaudeville. We called it musical. It, it's a bit of musical. It's a bit of variety. It's a bit of pop culture. It's a bit of there is. I, I don't know where. I, I'm sometimes thinking, oh wow, I have it, that. Where's that come from? It's just coming out. It's just become whatever it is. But I'm I'm a, just a product of being born in 1968 in Britain is basically what I am. Well, you know, if you look back at that time when you first came to America and then kind of where you are now, being a completely, totally, probably different human being than when you first stepped foot mm -hmm. in this country. And, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier and I just for, 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 I just need to say that this interview should be like 20 parts because anytime that me and you get on the phone, Regal, yeah. you know, I, or excuse me, Stephen or, Matthews or whatever. Sorry, not Nick. Matthews. Oh, don't. I know, I know. Oh, God. I know. But uh, Darren or whatever. But we. No. We, can, can I just say, can I just say something? Because I, I, I'm, I, I'm Church of England, but I, I'm an atheist. But I, I'm Church of England, right? We, everybody's christened, or they used to be in my age. The only time I ever went to church, I think, was when I was christened in England. So it doesn't matter. What you, I, I believe it's just a Catholic thing here, but. Again, I don't want to offend anybody who's religious, but I'm Church of England, which was a great church to be, you know, if you think about the history of that, Henry VIII just didn't want to be a part of the Catholic Church and wanted to get divorced. So he started his own church and then chopped all his wife's head off. But I'm, I'm born Church of England. So, but when I was, at, you start school at four in England and I had to go to a Catholic school and they treated us like lepers right and so again i got a grandfather who my, my, my dad my grandfather lived 50 yards from my house in a little cottage that my dad had the house that and i was born in the house that my dad built and he's so 50 yards away so from a, a toddler i was wandering up to my granddad's my dad also had his own business he was a he was a bricklayer so he was out working just all the time trying to get work so i spent a lot of time with my granddad so he was a big influence on me and he was also he did a bit of wrestling in the 1920s and boxed and did a bit of anything run for money and he had a dog that fought and he had a cockerel that fought and he did whatever he had to do well he drilled it into me about this don't have anybody call you that so I used to get knocked about by these nuns right <laughs> I mean if they if like Matthews and I just yeah, I get well, it. They used, have, they used to have a switch, right? And they're just whacking on the back of the hands and that. When I look back at it, I'm so glad that it was nuns and not priests because I was a stunner when I was seven. I'd have got smashed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might. I, I, I'm, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, um, well, I know you. I, see, I see what you did there. Right. I mean, you're always sort of the punchline, and I love you because of that. Right. Let me so get back to my. <laughs> let me get back. Carry on. So, you're not now. You're in this position with AEW, where you're now sort of a you know a master, a teacher, um, a uh, a gatherer, a leader right. in, in, a, in a way. Okay. I mean, that's your that's your, and right. and you were talking earlier about how you were responsible for a, an entire show, an entire company. You know, not so long ago. So coming out of that situation, do you feel like more relaxed now? Um, what are the biggest differences for you just as just as somebody who kind of can show up and, and do his job as opposed to all the cats you got to wrangle? I never really thought about it. I love my old job and I'm, everybody's got a different tale, right? I look at it like I've had a completely charmed life. I wanted to be a wrestler from my earliest memories, which was three, four, sitting with my granddad on his knee at first, watching wrestling, British wrestling, which, which is now called the world of sport thing. Wrestling was on for 33 years on a Saturday afternoon at four o'clock, British wrestling. I wanted to be a wrestler from my earliest memories. And so, for, since I left school at 16, I have been a full-time professional wrestler. I've never looked at a day at this. You never find any interview or anything of me moaning about this job. 
I've had a completely charmed life because my life was set down for laying bricks. That was it, right? So anything that's come after that, doesn't matter what I've gone through, anything that's gone wrong has been my fault. I've messed up at times, and but I knew what I was getting into from an early age. I've never been under any illusions whatsoever. When I started, and it was, this job was very, very different. I'm not one of these old, old wrestlers, uh, no. But there was no such thing as a wrestling school. You couldn't go to wrestling schools. You had to be brought in by a wrestler, right? I went to a ca carnival and I slowly got myself in and got hammered for the first two years that I was in this job. And I loved it. I, and I didn't, you know, there's, there's other stories I can tell you. There's a time when I nearly quit when I was 17 because I just, but some, some just one day gave me a, 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 a bit of a, like a light at the end of the tunnel. And so I stuck at it and, and it just paid off in dividends for me. Everything has been a bonus because I came into the job that I wanted. But, but the fellow that started me, Bobby Barron, in, in, on the, the, the fairground where I used to work when I was a, started when I was 15, once I started at 16 and actually left school and moved to Blackpool and was a full-time wrestler, he said to me, as soon as I moved up there, I mean, he just said, right, you can come and work for me. Okay, so I just left home at 16 and moved away from home and moved to the biggest resort town in Europe, which was like going from a little village to this mad world, but I was playing at being a wrestler, right? He said, know what you're getting into. You're gonna come into this job with nothing, because I had nothing. You're gonna leave it with nothing, because there's no money in it, because there was no money in Britain. Even when he, when he got on TV and stuff, there was still no, he didn't make a, a living wrestling, you had to have another job or you didn't live very well. And that's working full time, right? It was people were making not much money and being on TV and being full time wrestlers, right? You had to have an, another gig. You come into this job with nothing, you go out of it with nothing, you're going to be crippled up and it's a completely bent business, meaning a crooked business. Are you still in? Oh, that was it. And you, yeah, you're going to be completely crippled. And I went, yes, please. <laughs> because I've seen my dad being completely crippled from Brick Lane and, and, and worked till he was 83 and still crippled, but crippled even when he was younger at 30, in his 30s as I grew up. And I've seen all my uncles be crippled. And I've seen what working class people in Britain are, are like that work in factories and they have a mic. And, and I, there's nobody I love more in the world except for my, my obviously my wife and my children more than my dad. But he, he is, his whole life has been spent like looking at a row of bricks. So every single day that I've been in this job has been a bonus to me. Doesn't matter what, what's happened in it. So I've got a very different outlook than a lot of people. Right. And that's how it was. And, and, and I, I don't, this is just me, and there'll be people that get offended who, who, who are in this job that watch this. I don't care, right? Like you said, you don't care about what people think of you. If you don't like this job and it's too hard for you, get out of it. Go and do something else and let somebody who wants to do this, let some 16-year-old kid like me who wanted to do this, who had nothing else apart from laying bricks, in front of their lives, who wants to do this, do it, and you get out of it. If you don't want to do this and it's too hard and you, you don't like it and it's too hard for you. Because if you don't know the, the pitfalls of this job in this day and age, when I started in this job, there wasn't, you had no way of knowing what was going on in wrestling apart from you wanted to know it until you got into it, right? There was no way of reading about it. There was no way of knowing what the, the inner work is. Nowadays, there's no excuse, and there hasn't been. That's been going on since I came to America. If you don't like it, get out and give somebody else a chance. That's the way I feel about this, and I get passionate about that, and it bothers me. Don't do this. Don't whine and complain about this and still do it. Get out. Do something else for a living. Let somebody who wants to do this do it, because you're taking their job. No different than you're taking all them guitarist jobs 
when you have your band, like in every band that's, that's possible, right? Well, that's because I'm like you, you know, I, I didn't have a future to, right. to look upon. So right. the opportunity came and I took now it. Now you're jumping because, all over it, right? And you're jumping yeah. all over it, right? So I, that's what I do. But, but that's the thing, I, I, you know, and it's kind of one of those things. Like, I mean, do you see, you know, throughout your years, I'm sure you've seen, you know, certain wrestlers more hungry than another. Or those that are just kind of there, that it's a job. And uh, do you find that? Um, I mean, how do I how do I phrase this? Do you find that you're you're because uh, I know what you do. You help a lot of people if they ask, right? But if in they, today, yeah. if, and if they don't ask sometimes, but not for long, if I think they're not interested. Okay, so I we'll wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be sat talking to you. You would have no interest in talking to me about wrestling. Right. If if people hadn't have done that for me when I was younger. Right. But at what I'm asking, I guess, is in the modern wrestler, and we've talked about this hundreds of times. We've talked about this, the psychology, the the the, the matches, the whole thing. But are you finding these days that there are uh, the wrestlers, the younger generation, are more apt to ask questions to learn from the uh, from somebody who's been in the trade for so long? It's never tra It's never changed. I, that's why I'm the way I am, and I'm open-minded. It has never changed. I, I know people like to think that it has. There was people that asked, and then there was people that weren't. When I started, there was loads of there was loads of other sixteen-year-olds who wanted to be wrestlers. I saw them come and go. There were some that stuck it out, and some that didn't. It's 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 never changed. There's some that want to do this really. And there's some that don't. There's some that want to do this and get really famous and then not happy with it. Well, that's up to them. They can be, do what they want then because if they're still in it and they can make a living, great, good for them. And I'm, I'm happy for them if they're, if, as long as they get on with it. I'm happy to help anybody. Doesn't matter who it is. If you want to do this, I, or, the, the, the biggest thing for me, and I know and I'm plugging this podcast thing that I'm doing, let's get this out of the way. The reason I'm doing this is not for anything other than it takes a lot. I've been so fortunate to be born in, in 1968 for a lot of things, but because of the, the class of wrestlers that I was around and taught me stuff, they've given me a lot of things. And, and I've lived through a lot of or everything right we don't have to go into what i've gone through as far as but look at the, how fortunate i was to be born at that time and then to be around the best british wrestlers that have all been wrestling 20 and more years and best european wrestlers and then and then come to america and wrestling around having ricky steamboat and arn anderson and rick Flair. i've fortunately been around all these people i am willing to to I know that. I, I don't think there's anything special about me. I know I was just a kid who wanted to do this. I want to give that back. And I that's what I, I, I'm doing on this thing is to, you've got to have to listen to me tell a lot of stories because not everything connects with everybody. I can look in somebody's eyes and read them quicker than they wish they could. But I know that it, it, it took me, I, I, and I say this a lot, but you understand, I wasn't any good at this. I had to slowly learn and I died a thousand deaths along the way mm. before I ever, anybody saw me just on, on TV in England, never mind anywhere else. Right. And when I first saw myself on TV in England at 18, I went, oh God, is that what I look like? I don't belong on here. And I quit, <laughs> I quit the TV. I got a job on the TV and I quit and went to work for another company because I knew I wasn't quite ready yet. Right. right. So I want to give that back. Right, and I've always wanted to give that back to anybody who will work, but they've got to want to work hard. If they're just, I think they're just playing at this, or tossing off do, doing this. I've got no interest. I, I lose interest quickly. So there's people that have come in and out of my life that have done whatever. That, that they're either interested in, and they keep that. Hopefully, one or two of those people that I've given that have I've given my time to. Pass a little bit of that on, because I would hate for a time 
to be some some young lad or some young lady who wants to get into this wrestling job and there is no job to get into. Mm. Because this life has given me a charmed life. I am sat here now in my house. I, I live a very normal life. I don't, I, I don't live an extravagant life. I have a lovely, incredible wife that I've been with since I was 17. I've got three great children. I live in a very normal life, a very normal house and a normal life, right? My only thing in life is listening to my soul music and reggae and my ska music and wearing Fred Perry's and I have to buy nice suits to wear on TV and my lizards, right? That's it. I don't want there to, I want to give back as much as, from, from me thinking that when I was half decent at this, about 22, 23, and that, I know that sounds young, but I'd had so many people of the best people giving back to me from like 17 onwards. I've tried to help everybody. Well, see, that's my, you know, one of the things I was thinking is, I mean, and then I'll refer to Dennis, but like, cause I know he's got a million questions, but real quickly, I mean, I would think that you would have more in the tank as a wrestler, as an indie performer. Yes, no, you. No. Um, okay, so I did Chris Jericho's podcast and I finally told people what I'd been going through for the last whatever amount of years. I'd had a bad art for a long time, since 1997, it, it turns out. But it wasn't my heart. It was the skin around my heart. It, it, it had got infected and then started to calcify. So it was causing me to go in and out of rhythm and different all kinds of things. I openly admit, you, you everybody knows that I, I absolutely caned it from 1997 and 1998. And I dabbled quite, quite a lot from 1990, <laughs> like four onwards, right? But then that all went away so and I lived a hell of a life right I, I mean I, I've lived a hell of a life I, I, I had, had, a, had a blast doing all, all of this and then going out and doing whatever when the time came my body was wrecked by the time I was 40 I didn't realize how bad the art problem was I know now I knew at the time but I didn't tell anybody I broke my neck in, in when I was 25, I broke my neck and never told anybody. And a match against Ricky Steamboat, which you can see on the WWE Network, the first time I won the television championship, the, the finish is me giving him a German suplex. And if you know me, you know I can bridge well. I land, and if you actually watch it, you see my neck go bang to the side. And both my arms went dead and my legs went dead and I barely could lift the title up. I broke my neck then and didn't tell anybody. So I got through the next 20 years and had a hell of an incredible career. Couldn't have asked for any more, right? I know people will say that I should have been this. No, I had the exact career that I had ever imagined and, and more, a thousand times more than I, I was happy working on the fairground. I was happy doing that. I, I, I didn't need any more. I was a wrestler and that was it. So when it came to me, what happened was I did my, I wasn't wrestling much the last few years, but I, I had all kinds of injuries. Everything was injured, everything. But I was just getting through it because I just felt, a, 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 I wanted to get my 30. Started off with wanting to get 20. Everything, everything was injured, but your funny bone. Uh, uh, yes, well, that's, oh. that's always stayed. <laughs> Luckily, me and you are of the age where we can still... I, 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 please, youngsters, don't take... If you're listening to this, don't take this wrong. But I'm so glad I'm my age, can, and me and Lars, if, if we're normally together, that we can laugh at everything and, and not take offence to things and, and not, not mean any harm. It's just that's the way we got through life. Years ago, if you're, if you're a working class or a street kid, if you didn't laugh, you didn't get, you, you'd just never get out of bed. So we just, it's, it, it's, it can be gone in, in an instant and it's, it's no, it's just that's the we, we laugh a lot, right? And that's what gets us through stuff. That's why me and Lars get on such. But I had all these things. Well, I was slowly 
get my, you know, everything was going. And the final thing was I finally tore my pec and my, my bicep and I didn't get it fixed because I was already withering away. My neck was, but, and my heart was bothering me. And I had my final match with, with Claudio casting up, you know, and it was on NXT, a place that I'd been there from the beginning. And I spent 10 incredible years, incredible years there and changed a hell of a lot of people's lives that would never have got a chance. Right. And I don't usually say that, but if you didn't watch that, you realize the influence and what we did and change things and, and put out 36 incredible shows and all these other things and, and then network specials and whatever. I'd done all, I'd done my bit. So I never wanted to be one of those wrestlers that people go, oh, it's, it, it's good that he's just there, right? No, I had that match. I didn't know it was going to be my last match, but I knew it was going to be one of my last matches. I was thinking that from 2011 onwards. Mm-hmm. I had a match with Daniel Bryan where that's, that's on YouTube. And because he's the person who spent the most time with me, I insisted on doing it the night before I tore my meniscus in my my good knee. And I insisted <laughs> on, on wrestling on on to 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 make sure that he beat me because I thought this could be the last that this could be it. Because I, I was hanging on by a thread for the last several years of my career. And I, they were slowly working me out of it. So I had my last match. It couldn't have been with anybody I thought more of or put, you know, and Claudio's story is Claudio's story, but I know how much effort and work he's put into being as great as he is. It was with him. Um, I was already doing this, the, 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 the talent scouting and working with NXT. And so that was it. Well, what, what happened was a year later, I did have one more match when it was against Sami Zayn in front of about 30 people at a tryout in Dubai. Um, Two weeks later, I came back from there and I was in England on a show, uh, doing a, 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 a like a one of, one of my one-man show things and doing photo, uh, meet and greet. Somebody came up to take the photograph. Somebody He left and somebody else was coming up. I just went like that with, with my head and my legs went from under me and I held myself up against the wall. And I thought, oh, that's weird. And then I felt, all right. And then two weeks later, I was back in America and we went down to Orlando. My son had just, uh, my, my youngest son had just broken up from school. So we took him down. Then my wife came down with me for a week because I never moved to Orlando. I always stayed where I live in Atlanta. Moved, went down there for a week so we could take him to a few parks. We went to Gatorland. My wife put her hand on my shoulder as we got out of the car just to tell me something because she's not as tall as I am. And I fell against the car. My legs just went from under me. And I thought, I better get that checked out. Well, I got it checked out. And it, I re- they found out all this damage. There was four discs completely crushed mm-hmm. in my neck. Mm-hmm. So when you say, do any more? Oh, and then after that, I had open heart surgery. Not because I had any clogged arteries. It was to, I had to take the, this calcified sack around my heart take that away and now I've got a perfectly normal heart that's got a perfect everything is, score. Is is that so, the only is that the only sack on your body that is uh calcified? Yeah the, the, yeah uh, well you never know with me do you could all that's, wh- that's why I'm asking because yeah, yeah. okay I, I, I digress. well you never know do you I mean I'm I'm sure that we'll start with up here. I mean this has got to be I mean I've proper caned it in my life. So this has got to Got to, got to be not not so good, right? As far as everything else, it's probably hanging on for for you know for dear life, right? I mean, every day I wake up and I go like that, and there's not wood there. I think it's it's a bonus, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if there's not a cough in there, I'm not doing well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. I so did it. When, did when it. I had my last Listen. match, my last match was my last yes. match. I wouldn't want to taint that. Could I go out? I wrestled my son for an hour in November, right? Easily. I, 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 I wish I'd have felt this good now in the last 10 years I was wrestling. I didn't realise how, you know, I was just getting through it. I'm 54, though, and I don't want... Uh, why? There's young fellas out there that want to 
I don't need to be trying to, it's not about me anymore, mm. right? I, I, I've done my bit. I did 30 full years. As a, I worked it out from, with, I had a year off once with a heart problem. I, I've had injury, very, few, very little time off with injuries, a couple of suspensions, sometimes my fault, sometimes I still don't know why, why but that doesn't matter. I'll take it on the chin as I, I take everything on the chin. Um, I wrestled a full-time schedule for 26 years, averaging 180 days a year. I've done my bit. I don't need to do any more. Mm. I've left a body of work out there, which is, which is probably the worst body of work that I've left. Because if you've ever seen me on a live events, I'm far better wrestler than I ever was on TV. And, uh, well, and, you know what? I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna no, have to but, disagree with you. But I'm gonna, I, think, no, no, listen. I know so. I, I know so, right? Because I know what I've done. I, I know what I've done, and I know that's the fair. Re- that's the fair. But I'm saying that, like you know, you had an ability, and I kind of want to get talk about this a little bit more. But I mean. You, you know, when that term gets thrown around, you could wrestle a broomstick and the broomstick would have a great match. And so would you. I, I do think that you are one of those guys, you know, that can make anybody look good. But Dennis, I know you've been itching to talk. <laughs> and I feel really bad because it's like this is like a telephone conversation between me and, uh, yeah. and, and, and Darren. So, um, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, do you have a question, Dennis? I do, but I am enjoying sitting here listening to you guys just as much as I would be interviewing. So this is this is great both sides for me. But you mentioned uh, Brian Danielson, and in many interviews, you talk about how he called you to to kind of coax you to come to AEW. If that phone call was made by anybody else, I would, wouldn't be there. Okay, that's. No. I was just wondering about that. No. It's only only him that could have got me there, and um, so take that however you want to take it. And not, and you know it's funny because the shortest answer that he's given this I whole know, time right? was your fucking question. I know. So he's like, <laughs> all right, move aside. He asked me. He asked me, and because he's the person who's put up with me the most and listened to you know had to listen to a lot of the things that I'm again I don't want to. I'm plugging the podcast, but he's listened to all these ramblings of mine about what's got me here, my ideas, whatever that's made him, you know, take on board. And there's a lot of other people, but he's the one who's been around me since, well, as it would be April of 2000. Well, and the person who's had to listen with in depth phone calls and meetings and, and whys and hows and ideas about changing things when everything's going one way let's let's try and change it new change it another and he, he, everything as because i'm constantly trying to up the game of this and or change the detail of it and make you know because i was given a, a piece of advice by my hero which was a wrestler from britain called pete roberts who used to be in all, it was in New Japan a lot in the 70s, then he was in Old Japan a, a, a lot because um, he's Stan Hansen's best friend. And he was my hero. Uh, he was exactly, and one of the reasons why I got to travel out of England so much. And he's, I asked him advice. I wrestled him when I was 18, fortunately. And he made me look a thousand times better than I could have ever possibly thought I could be at the time. And I said, do you have any advice? And I thought he was going to tell me all kinds of things about holes and stuff. And he just said, make everything you do mean something else. Don't bother doing it. And he said, you'll be working on that far beyond ever you, you, you've ever, by the time you finish wrestling, and if you've got the right kind of mind for this. And I'm still, I, I'm, it's not nearly nine, it'd be nine years in November since I had my last match, or my last match that was at least filmed. Second, but last match. And I'm going, still going why didn't i do that why did i do that why didn't i do that why didn't i do that because that's the way my mind works is constantly trying to up the game whether people can keep up with 
what I think or my ideas actually resonate with them is, is another thing because how can you if you've only got so much experience? It's like you playing guitar, Lars. You, you, it, it's a constant trying to get, you, you know, yes, you can stagnate if you want or you can regress. And you, I'm sure you see plenty of people. You wouldn't be out still doing your thing and playing with as many people if you're not constantly working on or trying to think. And, and it's like the, I've heard... Uh, Noel Gallagher say about Johnny Marr like Johnny Marr's so good he doesn't know how good Johnny Marr is right <laughs> well you are on that le- I know I know enough about you to know that you're on that's how people look at you you know you, it's like how, how do you after a while it, it's but now it, it, it's like okay I, I've it, it's constantly trying to up the the, the the game or the whatever of and, and it doesn't matter about the style. It doesn't mean do this style. I love loads of different styles of wrestling. But there's certain things that you can add to it that can make it better. And I'm constantly trying to think of that. I'm, I have to try and sh- shut myself off sometimes because I'm constantly thinking, God, why didn't I do that? And people think I'm supposed to know what I'm doing. I still <laughs> think it, nine times out of ten, I'm thinking, God, I feel like I don't know anything. And then I go, I, and I hear myself talking to people and there's all this stuff that just happens to be in here. And I'm going, oh yeah, I, I know a lot, but I still think I know nothing. Because I'm still coming up with ideas, but I'm only saving them for the right people now. Because if I, t- that's, if I just tell everybody, then everybody will do a second-hand version of it. I need to find the right people that are actually willing to put the time in. Well, I want to I want to I want to touch on this because your creative mind is something that obviously you have a wealth of knowledge. Do you find it different because we have a lot of wrestlers on here and from different companies? We we, we don't really get WWE wrestlers unless they've left the company, and I, I then because that's just the WWE's policy. You know they don't you know they want to set everything up, and I and I totally get that. My my point is is that. You know, you obviously had a lot of creative freedom over there with NXT. I mean, you made something out of nothing. Um, but now you're in AEW, which a lot of the wrestlers will come on here and say that they've never experienced more creative freedom. Now, where are you at with that? I mean, because it seems like you did have a lot of creative freedom over at the WWE. And now you're in a place which sort of, um, how would I say, nurtures that. And uh, they, they, they almost, almost expect that from the wrestler or the performer. So where do you find, do you draw a connection to the two or do you think there's similarities? Is this me personally? Me yes. personally, I just, I'm happy to just, again, we talked about it earlier. I don't need to know what I'm doing until I'm told, and it can be five minutes before, go out and do that. And it just comes out, William Regal, whatever William Regal has become. Right. So I'm loving that. Um, it seems that the, the people who, who are have put time in and, and effort and, and the ones who uh, they're doing they're doing that. Not just this is not just AW, this is everything. I I really I'm always there, but that, that's what I, I do. I'm, there's no agenda, there's no anything. I'm I'm there for, for, for anyone. For a lot of the youngsters, I feel very sorry for them because there's just not enough work. There's not enough. And nowadays, it doesn't matter what company you're working for, you're just thrown onto TV and expected to be good straight away, mm. right? It, it, it's, it's like, I, I know I couldn't survive. That, that's another reason why I'm, I am who I am because I've always understood and never got believed anymore, and I, I truly don't believe this, that I could survive in today's world. That you are expected to be as good pretty much straight away or to be able to perform on TV and whatever else. Like I said, when I was youngster, I was wrestling full time. When I say full time, we used to do 20 week summer seasons when I was 16, 17, 18, wrestling a minimum of two shows a day, a minimum. Right. And then I saw my, and, and then I got retrained. I was full time wrestler and I got retrained. By the best wrestler in Britain. 
or one of the two best wrestlers in Britain when I was 17 for 18 months. And then I debuted on TV and I saw myself and I went, I don't belong on here. So I, I, I have no idea how people get, I, I marvel when people can, can get connect in this day and age. I just want to try and help them to like to, to take some, what I can do more than anything, the, the best thing I can do for any of them, if they want to ask is just ask me not what to do. Because I can't tell them what to do because who knows what to do. Everybody connects in a different way. Anybody who starts giving you formulas and what works and what doesn't, they're just talking a lot of bollocks. They're just talking absolute bollocks. They've probably never done it themselves or they or they just full of their own nonsense. Mm. Right? How many people do you know in, 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 in your world that can do everything right and it doesn't, it just doesn't work out for them? But then there's people who do can do loads of things wrong and it works out right. Some of the best bands in the world, right? Can put two, three hundred people in club, right? We're both Motred fans. Go to Europe and, and wherever else, Japan, and they're selling out arenas. Come to America and they, they were putting 200, lucky to put 200 people in a club. I know, because I was at the 25th anniversary and stood on the side of the stage, right? And it was a 300, why, why, why wasn't it held in the, in, in the Staples Centre? It wasn't. But you can have some of the worst, it will sell out every arena. And it's the same in wrestling. I can't tell you what's going to work. I can tell you what won't work most of the time because I've failed at it. <laughs> right? It, it, or I've seen this or you come to me, what Friday is, well, I can tell you I've seen it. I've done it or I've failed at it or I've seen it done because I was born at the right time. I've seen it done this many ways. Maybe you can try that and see if it works. But now you're only getting to try it once a week. On well, TV. Let, well, let me ask you this, Simple. because, I mean, you were taught, basically, you're going to be broken, crippled by the time you leave this business, correct? Yeah. yeah. That, was your, that was your learning curve. That's and, what, what you, and it turned out like that. I'm, I'm, I'm crippled and I'm, I'm, I'm potless. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, okay, so we take the case of Tom Billingsley, the dynamite yeah. kid. Unbelievable. Right? I mean, okay, so it was such an influence on me when I was... Seven, well, let me just let me just ask this real quick question, and I want you to, to, to hear the story because this is going to be my last question. But I mean, as these things were unfolding for him, him ending up in a wheelchair, I mean, there was talk of psycho, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. My point is, is as these things were unfolding to him uh, uh, on his life and and showing the world what this this business was doing to people, did it give you any kind of cause for concern about what you were doing? At that moment, or did it give you no. like a no? Okay, it's because you're English, and I love you. Okay, go ahead, please. No, <laughs> no. Uh, no, no, and 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 I you're fucking I, nut. I you're a fucking him. nutter. You're a nutter. You know that. I, I knew about what he went through, and I still ended up going right. I, I was the the sense, you know. I I lived. I, I'm not from being sixteen. I was out. I moved to a resort town, Blackpool, within a mile walk of, of my house or anywhere that I lived, there was 52 nightclubs and 300 bars, right? Playing all kinds of music, which is another thing we connect over, right? I lived in a, a mad world, but I didn't drink or do anything until I was came to America. And I knew all about what had happened to, to Tommy right and i idolized him when i was a, a, a young child and then he disappeared out of my life i was watching him live every two weeks at the, my local wrestling hall when he was 16 and i was seven right my dad i was fortunate my dad took me to rest not only was i seeing him on tv i was seeing him every two weeks in my local wrestling hall and I knew all these things and I still went off the rails and caned it myself because sometimes I'm going to, this is a, 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 
a, a quote which is apt for this podcast. I probably wouldn't use it on anything else, but from a, a, a book about Keith Moon. And his handler, his, basically his handler was a fellow called Dougal. And he said, and then the same with me and the same with Tommy and the same with everybody that you know that's gone that way. When you get what you want, you end up looking for something that isn't there. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's it. <laughs> I, I guess my last question, and I want to kind of focus it around fan reaction to you. Uh, you're a guy that we all grew up. Uh, I, you're the villain. We all hated you. And then you were in a, a phenomenal comedy role in WWE when, you know, I, more I'd than one, more than one. I, I mean, they were so good to me and gave me so many great, like great entertaining roles. And, and, and it was in, 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 incredible. Uh, yeah. It, you, you go to AEW, you come out for your debut there. Was there a little apprehension of how another company's fans would view, view you after being a, the company guy in WWE for so long? Or were you at that point confident in who you were that you were going to come out and get a reaction? Oh, I never thought about it for a second. I, I, I didn't, I, I, I don't. This is somebody I, I, I we've, we've talked about my mindset. If I get any, the slightest reaction, it is what it is. I spent most of my life in America trying to get booed. <laughs> right? So do you think I'd have cared if anybody would have booed me? <laughs> right? I, it wouldn't have mattered to me. I'd have just... I, 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 you get... I've said this on a few things lately. You start off in this job by selling, which is acting. Well, when you get decent at this... And it's the same with you, Lars, and same with anybody in any music. You learn your chords and, and, you, and you learn your songs, but then you learn to react. And once you learn to react, then you can control your audience. And it takes some people a short time to do that. It takes some people a lifetime. But you have to learn to react. I didn't think about it. Twice. I was just asked to come. Brian asked me. If he hadn't asked me, I still wouldn't be there. He asked me to come, and I, it was, yeah, that sounds like fun, because I've just been, I, you know, I was quite happy. I, I wanted a year off. I've done nothing but wrestling since I was full-time, since I was 16. The only time I've been off is when I've been ill or injured, and really ill, right? And there's only three weeks of that that I can't remember, because I had a, a, two bleeds on the brain, like I had an injury and two bleeds on the brain in 2018. So I can remember everything else. Well, not vague memories, but sometimes. But I, I, I was just coming out, and I was like, I couldn't believe it when he first said to me, "Oh yeah, you're going to do a thing." He just asked me to come, and I went, "Yeah," because you're asking. And then he said, "Yeah, you're going to do a thing with me." I went, "Oh, that's nice," and the thing with John. Oh, great, because I've got history with both of them. And I just walked out and never thought twice about it. And I still, I haven't watched that back yet. I haven't watched anything back that I've done yet because it's just, I, I don't want to get caught because I'm, I just want to react to what the situation is and not start thinking about it too much because I learned that from watching the Michael Caine um, interview when I was in, in my, before I was a teenager. And it always stuck with me. It was on a famous chat show called Parkinson. And they talked about him being a great actor and he stopped Michael Parkinson. I don't know why it, it stuck with me. And then, and then once I started wrestling, it, it, it like always stayed with me and I tried to work towards it. He said, I'm not an actor. I'm a reactor. I, le I learned to react off. He said, I might know what I'm going to say, but I don't deliver the lines until the person has said theirs because they could, but they could say it in a different tone of voice or they could say it with a different look and so I've based a lot of what I do off just reaction. Once I got comfortable with a certain skill set, of once I know that I could get through a wrestling match, and I had to at my at a young age of doing long wrestling matches, I've just by the time I got to America, I could just react off of anything, whatever you give me, I just react off it. So I was when I went there, I, I was just stood backstage. Okay, all right, you're up next. Okay, 
And everybody said, oh, you this and that. I honestly don't know. I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear the crowd. I didn't hear anything. I just walked out and I reacted to the two people that were, were doing their thing. And then I walked back and I was like, okay, thanks, fellas. And that's what I've done ever since I've been there. Because if I start trying to watch it and think about it, I might not, I might end up forcing things into things that don't need to be forced. We have, luckily, everything about this group that I'm in is all, there's reality to it. So it, it, there's chem, we have chemistry, instant chemistry with the, all of us. And Wheeler's joined it and it's instant, nice lad. And I, I, I knew him from a year ago and nice lad and I'd like to hire him. And he's got a great work ethic. So it's just, it's just reaction. I'm not, I don't think about it. I just go and react. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. And I hope I continue doing that and don't even think about it until it's all over. And then one day I'm sat here when I'm finally not doing anything. And then I can go back and watch it and see. And then all I'll do, I know exactly what I'll do, is do what I do about my wrestling career and go, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I do that? Because that's the way I'm built. We can't end it any other way than that. Uh, Lars, holy shit, you brought the you brought the guest this week, man. No, he brought himself. <laughs> uh, listen, the Gentleman Villain Podcast, go listen to it everywhere you get your podcast. Matt Kuhn, once again, a phenomenal talent. To hear you and him together makes my heart happy. So uh, thank you for the podcast as, as a fan. Uh, Lars, take it home. I don't well give it up for my friend the cunt. You know what I mean? I love him oh, to death. Thank you. <laughs> no, no not him. really. Thank you. No, you, you know, but honestly, one of the best. So what, in the best. we can obviously yeah. get away with a lot of things on this. Oh podcast. yeah, we can say shit. So fuck, cunt, bitch, we're our goddamn own bosses. Oh right, so asshole. You know, you know. I, I, again, this this could be the end of me, but who, I, I don't care anymore. Who cares? I, 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 I'm. Throw in the fucking towel. You got a so hole in your you, heart with calcified fucking sacks. Right, right. You know, you know, my wife, she had tattoos. She's she was a punk. And then like you've met my brother-in-law, yeah. he's a punk. And my wife's a punk from when punk was actually, you know, originally started. And, um, she's covered in tattoos and piercings before it was it, it was a it was a thing. Well, the only thing she didn't have. Tattooed, you know. Mm. Mm -hmm. So she went the other week, and we're still was, recording, by the way. Just yeah, so you yeah. know, yeah, yeah. I'm, well, okay. you know, I'm, I'm trying, said you know, you need to. I, I, I want this finishing up, you know, because I'm covered all over. She, she's the whole over. She, I want this tattooing, you know. He said, well, he we said, it's going to be very painful down there. We're going, to, we're going to have to numb it. She went, that's okay. And he went, num, 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 num. <laughs> anyway, so that's the, that's the end of that. Right. All right. For, for everybody at home, the podcast is over. We'll say our goodbyes <laughs> off. For, for everybody's career, his is over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight. This has been educational. Right. <laughs> <laughs>